from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report, where we count down the top 10 topics of the week that make us go wow. wow. I'm co-founder of World of Wonder, Fenton Bailey, joined by my fabulous cohorts, Tom Campbell, our Chief Creative Officer. Hello. And James St. James. Hello. Oh, I didn't know if he was with us. There Thank you. You are, you are. So normally we count down the top 10 things of the week. And occasionally we do like a theme episode. And this is, um, we are going to do the top 10 record covers that made us go, oh my God, life is worth living. Because back in the day, record covers were a thing, not perhaps anymore, but we We call them album covers on this side of the pond, Fenton, oh. just for those, yes. Oh, okay. Vinyl. There has been some debate among us whether this will work or not. So <laughs> audience listening, Please uh, let us know if talking about old visual things on the radio is really is really working for you. I think it it stands if if we are eloquent enough, if we uh, can elucidate our thoughts, I think we can get this across. I have no doubt I love that, that all of us have the ability to gas on about an album cover for five minutes. I, I don't think this is going to be a problem. Please, please only do three or four minutes. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> it, well, so it, this is up to your editing skills, then we'll see if you can rise to the challenge. But I just want to equate this to the way on QVC they have to sell sense over the television. So they have to come up with like metaphors. That's what this is going to be. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I think it's going fine so far. And I think we're already <laughs> running over time. I, I, I don't <laughs> think you need to poo-poo it before we eat even start i think that i want to get people on our side i want to be an underdog i want to bring him with us well okay lead the way with number 10 tom number 10 it's such a hard topic because you have great ones you guys have chosen but i had to do albums that were in my house because like fenton you said you would buy you would save up your pennies you would go to the store you couldn't buy all of them you could you'd buy one you'd bring it home and you'd listen to it over and over and over again all you had was the front and back cover and if you were lucky it opened and if you're lucky it had a sleeve with lyrics or something on it mm. and i am and was and will always be a huge linda ronstadt fan and she was she bridged that time or right before the time when rock and roll was very serious and she was a serious artist, but part of her appeal was she was a sex symbol. And instead of having to reinvent yourself, every song for every video, you know how like people have to like reinvent, and reinvent. You did it with each album. And she, and she had a long career in this, in the, in the 68 with the stone ponies in 74, she hooked up with a uh, producer, Peter Asher who came from Apple Records, who worked with the Beatles, who had dated Paul McCartney's sister. And he did uh, Heart Like a Wheel, the album, which redefined her, it started making her like a huge cult queen of rock. And then they did Prisoner in Disguise, but he must have turned her on to the artist known as Kosh, John Kosh, K-O-S-H, who I know has many other accomplishments, but he curated Linda's album covers and the one that I'm going to point out the one that caught my eye first was an album called Hasten Down the Wind as usual it had lots of really interesting uh, non-commercial songs the hits on it the covers were That'll Be the Day the Buddy Holly song but the album cover Linda is wearing remember the 70s were all about nipples not about boobs <laughs> but about nipples and she's on the beach presumably in Malibu she's wearing just like a strapless gauze white gown that prominently displays her nipples as she kind of coquettishly looks over her shoulder and there's a horse behind her on the beach. What's going on? Hasten oh, down the wind. And it was just so sexual. Obviously, I'm gay. I was gay well, then. But a, horse, there was... a horse is not a horse, of course, of course, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you and see, I think you've done on... a great job. You've taken me to the 70s. I'm th it's ocean vibes, horses. I mean, it, it, you've taken me nipples that. and yeah. nipples, yes, and it's nip it's just it's 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 this haunting photo that matches the haunting things. And and Linda, of course, reinvented herself, or or I should not so much reinvented, but kept exploring different genres. And he was there. So her next album, which was the huge, huge one, Simple Dreams, she's like in a dressing room and she's in like silken pajamas but it's all reflections because she didn't want to be a total 
hoochie mama. But she still was sort of selling that. And the inner sleeve was this incredible picture of her with like a flower in her hair, like an orchid in her hair. And she's just looking at the camera. And I had that poster and that was in the, in the album. And then she went on to do like uh, uh, living in the USA and there's pictures online of Kosh, like putting her in roller skates, holding her up, pushing her down the street. Remember that great album cover where she's in roller skates for back in the mm. USA? All him, all different styles. And then she did um, her punk album, which was called uh, uh, Mad Love. And it's her in a telephone. It's like black and white and her in a telephone booth looking scared. And then he, she went on and she did the Nelson Riddle albums. And those were like, got more and more beautiful. The first one was just her like in a, par in a 40s party dress with a Walkman next to her. And then they were so popular because no one thought those would be. It was like a hat box that would open and reveal her coming off a plane with 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 you know poodles, standard poodles, and 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 forties furniture. So and then the, the last one that I remember, although I kept working with her, was the trio album with Emmy Lou Harris and Dolly Parton, and that was done as sort of like like cut out doll country. Uh, country uh, cowgirls. So I've broken all the rules by talking about several. No, but like amazing that one artist would work with an art, with a recording artist over such a long period because they yes. often switch it up and they get someone else to design the cover. And yet you wouldn't. I mean, there obviously there's a there's a certain continuity or certain integrity, but they're all different. They're all beautiful, and each one signaled to us there weren't there weren't you know again there weren't videos there weren't all this kind of visual stuff there wasn't even entertainment tonight i like to remind people that which i now now is is out of date but there was no enter there was no people magazine it was just you know the world and and any kind of little nugget you could pull and those album covers and the linda rosta album covers done by kosh who i still i think is still with us um we should do a documentary with him. Amazing. Anyway. Yeah, he is still with us. I was sh shocked and amazed because John Kosh's work is going to pop up in the show later on too. All right. Let's go on to number nine, James. Number nine. You know, some album covers are, uh, everybody knows, you know, especially if you're over 30 years old, everybody knows the Madonna, uh, you know, first album. Everybody knows the... Um, Fleetwood Mac with the balls hanging down. You know, <laughs> I just have to say that, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Grace Jones. There are these albums that everybody knows. I have chosen for my first one an album that is a little more obscure, and you might have to Google it to know what I'm talking about. I, I include it because it changed my life when I first saw this album cover. Picture it. Saginaw, Michigan, 1981. <laughs> Teenage Jimmy Clark is at the record store at the mall, and I'm flipping through the new albums of the week, going through each one and going through each one. And I come across this album of Klaus Nomi, Klaus Nomi's uh, debut album. And I have no idea who he is. I have no idea what the hell I'm looking at. It is this arresting image of this freak of this this man he's got this white white makeup he's got these black cupid doll lips his hairline starts in the middle of his head and then goes up into these weird tufts these weird black tufts he's wearing this oversized plastic tuxedo that is like an inverted triangle with a big plastic bow tie on it you just the image is so crazy and i asked the guy at the record store who is this he had no idea who it was but i <laughs> knew i needed this album and i took it home i put the needle on the record and i hear lightning striking again this weird falsetto voice he's doing opera to a new wave beat he's singing in german it just blew my little mind wide open suddenly doors were opening in my head i started to see a future for myself where i could dress in in big plastic tuxedos i i saw makeup i saw men in makeup like the whole world just started tilting for me as i stared at this cover and i must have i to this day I look at this album cover and just gasp at the audacity of how outrageous it was and how it just, but it fits who he was so perfectly. And there's nothing affected about it. He is just this bizarre creature from the planet. Know me is what he said, you know? Um, Some people may know him from his appearance on Saturday Night Live. Well, that's David just Bowie. 
Right. Because I, once I had known who he was, then all of a sudden he showed up on Saturday Night Live singing behind David Bowie with Joey Arias in Boy, those little swinging. In the, Yes. The tube skirts. And that just, again, blew my mind. Who is this? Where is this going on? Who are these people? It just, it was one of those things that just changed my life forever and ever. Klaus Nomi, the debut album. Look at it. And I hope you're as, as entranced as I was. James, Ooh. thanks for making the definitive argument that it's nature, not nurture. That we are who we are, and we find what we need to find just when we need it. I love that. It's true. It's true. You do remind me of Klaus Nomi, actually, James. I can see that. There's an empathy in a good, in a, no, in a good way. It's the it? shoulders. <laughs> Moving on, segueing number eight. Number eight. David Bowie. Of course, when we came up with this theme, you both said, oh, then it's going to do David Bowie. <laughs> and it's true. I'm not going to disappoint. But the choice might be unusual. It's 1974. And he comes out with this album called Diamond Dogs. Now, Bowie was already a sensation in England, at least. Certainly less so in America, I guess. He didn't really have any hits in America. He was cool, right? But but not that well known. But there was great speculation about what he was going to do next. He had done Ziggy Stardust and Spiders from Mars and um, previous albums, Man Who Sold the World and Hunky Dory. And the rumor was that he was going to do the 1980 Floor Show, which was sort of inspired by George Orwell's 1984. And everybody was just talking about it. And then suddenly... Out comes Diamond Dogs. And I was like, well, what happened to the 1980 floor show? Well, it turns out there was some problem with getting the rights. So he did a bit of a pivot and came up with Diamond Dogs. This album cover is amazing. It is one of the things I loved about the golden era of record covers was that you do the gatefold sleeves. So you wouldn't just, it would be packaged as 12 inch, but then it would open up. So you'd have like just twice the space to do a picture. And Bowie got this artist called Guy Pilat. And Guy Pilat was known for, he'd, re he'd released a book a couple of years before called Rock Dreams. And it was a collection of photographs, a very kitschy, beautifully, almost, you remember like hand tinting photographs? How they'd have a weird color yes. sense. In the 70s, they started doing airbrush art, which was sort of similar. It was photorealistic almost. But the colors were always slightly yeah. off and slightly sort of kitschy. And this book, um, Rock Dreams, was a huge hit. Um, and Bowie saw it. In fact, his friend Mick Jagger was going to do use Guy Pilar to do the Rolling Stones. It's only rock and roll album cover artwork. And Bowie, sneaky as he was, immediately got a hold of Guy, went round the back, immediately got a hold of Guy Pilar because his album... Diamond Dogs was going to come out first. So he beat the Rolling Stones to the punch, ripped off his own friend Mick Jagger's idea. Anyway, the cover is, depicts, as you might expect, Diamond Dogs, David Bowie lying down, and he's got his normal David Bowie face on the head, and then the rest of his body is this dog, just lying there in a loose sort of way. And it's a very sort of futuristic, dystopian landscape, almost like in front of a sort of peep show, but Bowie is a, is a dog. And the big scandal was that they went to press and no one thought about what to do about the naughty bits, the dog, the dog's cock. And it was originally <laughs> in the drawing. And then they all freaked out like, oh my God, we can't possibly release this. And they had to recall a whole bunch of the albums, reprint the cover with the, the, the dog's cock and balls Airbrushed out the new, the neutered version, if you will. The neutered version. That's right. But who are these people behind him? These sort of crazy, creepy people. What is that? Well, the whole album is very seventies. It's very conceptual. It's a sort of a work set in the future. Society has broken down. No more big wheels and dogs the size of cats feast on rats the size of people. It's it's a dystopian vision. And sort of people are scurrying around in a debased state. And though the, the diamond dogs are sort of running society and they're out on the loose. And the two ladies in the background are, are female diamond dogs. They're 
Diamond oh, Pitches. Okay. I guess. Yes. And, and what are the songs from this album? Because I don't think I know this album. Diamond Dogs. I think Rebel Rebels on this album. Oh, okay. Really. Sure. Um, when you rock and roll with me, it wasn't a hits laden album, but all very atmospheric and of a piece. Um, now, how old were you when this came out? Because that always seems to to sort of. Well, I was fourteen. I was fourteen. Very, and, yeah. Uh, my sister was getting married, and my parents were so excited about it, and throwing her lovely big wedding, and and I was in the basement with my best friend Robert, and we had this album, and we yeah. were just pouring over it and the most infuriating thing was even though it was a gatefold sleeve they didn't print the lyrics oh. so we spent days transcribing the lyrics <laughs> yes. putting the needle on the record yes. writing it down yes. typing it up because you know what is going on what does it all mean and you open the album and there's this fabulous montage layered cityscape that's very sort of broken down but very vague and, and misty i mean it's real it's a real milestone in dystopian cultural uh, dystopian sci-fi i guess is what it was and i would just love to this day to see a movie a diamond dogs movie because it's just it's just fantastically sort of grotesque anyway long story short mick jagger was really pissed off decided not to use guy pilar on the as the cover artist for their next album oh. and um well, yeah, that's what I was. That's what I popped up to say. Isn't um, David Bowie kind of after talking to uh, Jane County on Night Fever? David Bowie's kind of famous for taking things from other people and using them as his own, right? Yeah, he was a, in an era before sampling. He was a sort of sampler. He was sort of Gaga esque, I suppose, before Gaga, of course. But would just take this, take that, reinvent himself. I mean. What, my favorite Bowie period is his very uncool period when he was doing sort of Lindsey Kemp miming and playing uh -huh. an acoustic guitar because he really was naff and then suddenly became somehow incredibly cool. And Diamond Dogs was a part of that sort of really cool. It was very bleak, very sort of um, menacing. Is the one right at, is, does he do Aladdin Sane right after that or is Aladdin Sane earlier? Aladdin right? Sane came right before. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The and then, uh, and then, Thin White Duke and all of that, right? Came after. Okay. Okay. Mm. Now, on lists that I looked at for uh, this researching this show, Aladdin Sane was usually the highest David Bowie album cover. Just FYI. Yeah, I think Diamond Dogs is better. David, the the Aladdin Sane cover is the is zig the lightning bolt on his face. Oh, right. Yes. And you course. open it up, and he's completely naked head to foot, but it's sort of all sort of silvery, so you can't see what's going on down there. I guess okay. like, Bowie's nudity and his bits have been a bit of a thing in his career. Well, if you got it, flaunt it. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Right. Honorable mentions time, right, Blake? Yeah. Who goes first? I had asked my friends on uh, my followers on Twitter if they would give me some examples of their favorites. And some of them that we got were Roxy Music. I'm sure, Tom, you remember. And Fenton with the throwing the javelins, very disco. Beauty and the Beat, the Go-Go's. Remember ah. that where they're in the towels in the sauna. Uh, craft work. Uh, any Grace Jones album could have could been. The Island album. Life. The Island yeah. Life, Jean-Paul Goode. Oh, any yeah, the, all the Jean Paul Goud stuff is fantastic. Culture Club, Karma Chameleon, just how beautiful he looked on that album cover. Blur, remember with the dogs attacking the, the attacking Heart dog. Life. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I'll I'll have some more later on, but um, those are just some of the ones that people I just gasp. We're counting down the top ten album covers of all time that made us go wow, and we'll continue with the countdown when we come back after the break here on the Wow Report. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. Fenton here with Tom and James and Blake. We're counting, we're doing a special. We're counting down the top 10 album covers that made us go, ow, I actually, did. yes, changed our lives. That's why not. We've reached number seven. Number seven. Again, just putting it in context, because James mentioned this, but you would 
not only would you buy the albums that you bring home, you got to flip through the albums at the record store. And there are so many albums that I know the covers, but I couldn't afford to buy them. And in my hometown, Newport, New Hampshire, growing up, 10, 000, uh, 6, 000 people, there was the Johnson's Ben Franklin, the five and dine that had the equivalent of like three milk cartons of albums, right? And some singles on racks on the wall. And if we were lucky, we got to go to Claremont, which was 10 miles away and it had like 10,000 people to the grants, which was a department store. But you almost like became, I became, I would know all the album. I know if they sold or didn't sell the Jane Oliver album was always there. Anyway, um, this album uh, was at, a, at, a, at an explosive point of this legend's career. And it's the 1980 Diana Ross, Diana cover. It's yeah. the album that has ups that Nile Rodgers and Bernard Barnett Edwards did. It's got upside down. I'm coming out. Classic, amazing male piano. And you know the seven. This is this was it released in May of 1980. And as no one likes to imagine, 1980 is a lot like the 70s. You know, like the, the first year of the new decade is sort of the culmination of the decade. But it, the 70s had been Diana. She had been a huge star in the 60s, supported by Barry Gordy and and through the Supremes. They had the, the the top shelf treatment better than any other girl group. When he took her out of the Supremes and made her a solo artist, gave her every opportunity. Oftentimes people would have hits and then not have hits and they won't they fade out. He would give her another hit. We get every hit. So Diana Ross was, you know, Lady Sings the Blues. She was pop. She was disco. She was all these things. But in the 70s, it been about excess. And, and, and it was about her, it, it was teetering towards success looked like a Vegas act, right? It was, be, be, Beagles and, be and everything on Drag Race now, but you know it was it was sequins and, and big things. big big hair and the yes. the, 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 the May gowns and the feathers yes. and capes yes. and, 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 and and roller skating dancers. Gone back to she has gone back to that. There's no doubt about it. So, There's yeah. no rothing about that. But what was so again in terms of recreating yourself in terms it wasn't the videos. There were no videos. It was the album cover, black and white. Diana Ross, wet hair, white T-shirt rolled up in the sleeves, tight tight jeans, caught. Mm -hmm. Just looking at the camera, like like expression, looking like she has no makeup on, just and just beautiful. It was shot by Scavulo. Oh, sure. Um, there's a legend, which I don't believe, but I'll, I'll sell a legend, which is she was she'd been shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, you know, looking like Diana Ross, beautiful. And she was leaving and her hair was wet. And he said, Wait a minute, bend over. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe this for one second, but I love the legend. <laughs> Wait a minute, bend over. Okay, another, another, another thing I read is that that supermodel that uh, Gia is that her name? The yeah, the yeah, famous Rangi, yeah, yes. That th those are her jeans that were borrowed. They were just sitting there, like put on Gia's jeans. Oh, um, they're probably all. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing about the album, which meant that you were a big deal, was if you opened the album all the way, it was the full picture. So you didn't, the, the cover was just, you know, her upper body. And then you saw the jeans and, and, and I'm telling you, the zipper was going to bust. And the, again, Diana Ross, the thinnest, most beautiful woman I was going to say, she, she's, she's about 50 pounds anyway. But she's yeah. just packed into it. You know, um, you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. This person's out debut album cover reminds me a lot of this album cover. And their career reminds me a lot of Diana Ross's Beyonce's Dangerously in Love. With the oh. chain link and the jeans, nice. Okay, you know okay. she was, she's wearing, was an incredible influence on so she's many. She's wearing like this diamond like top, and then the the photographer was like, "What if we just put you in jeans?" And she didn't bring any jeans, so the photographer lent Beyonce her jeans. But so it's kind of yeah, I love it. I was gonna ask if maybe it was inspired by. Um, Patty Smith's horses cover, you know, the Maple Fork picture oh, of Patty yeah. Smith with the thing, because it's similar, sort of black and white, kind of like just, oh, we just took a picture. Like, yeah. as well to. The difference is, though, is that there's nothing glamorous about Patty Smith. There okay. really isn't, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but the, even when you take Diana Ross out of her feathers and LeMay and big uh -huh. hair, she is still the most glamorous woman on but the it's planet. Cabulo. It's a high fashion yeah. photo that's stripped down to next to nothing. And it's, 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 it's stunning. It's a piece of art. The album also was incredible because, you know, Michael Jackson had Off the Wall out and he was about to become the biggest thing in the world. But I I say in 1980 and 81, Diana Ross was the biggest star in the world. It was her end of her time at Motown. She would leave to go to RCA. She was challenged on this album. as She was challenged, you know, Barry Gordy always put her with people. She had been hanging out at Studio 54, heard a lot of chic, uh, freak out. 
And so she wanted to work with them. There's a long story I'll make short, which is there were very young producers, but now Rogers and Bernard Edwards did this really raw kind of mix. And they sent it to Motown and Motown was like, Nyuh-uh. and they brought in Diana's normal mixer. And you can hear both. They both exist now and they're both fabulous, but they did have a magic thing. They knew how to get like Diana's breathless, exciting um, performance. But mm-hmm. that album, I would say that was the peak of all of her work happened there. And, and the picture matches it. And it's Mwah. and it's called Diana from 1980. Don't be confused because every album Diana Ross is called Ross, Diana, Diana, Ross, <laughs> Ross, Ross, <laughs> Diana, Diana, Diana Ross. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, let's move on to number six, James. Number six. This one is going to be hard for people to understand if you weren't there at the time. Oh, good. Uh, You don't understand how iconic it was when it came out. I'm talking about Duran Duran Rio, okay? And Fenton is going to have a problem with this, and we're going to talk about that later on. But, um, Patrick Nagel was the the artist who did the the album cover. Hmm. And Patrick Nagel um, was famous for being an illustrator uh, for Playboy magazine throughout the 70s and 80s. And his style is he does this incredibly flat, two-dimensional, beautiful women. If you ever went to a hair salon in the 80s. Well, that's what I was just going to say. I was going to say, you know these pictures from hair salons and manicured nail salons in the neighborhood. They're they're still there today if you're walking down the street. But the style is described as art deco meets pop art meets Japanese street style. And the women, I like I said, are two-dimensional, white, white face, black, black hair flowing. So when super you, flat, isn't it? It's, it's very well, flat. It's very flat, but it's it's very post disco, post new wave, early MTV. You can't escape these Nagel images. And if you look that, up nineteen eighties in the dictionary, there is a Nagel picture next to it. Well, not only nineteen eighties, but this album is came out in nineteen eighty two, May of nineteen eighty two, and it is the most May nineteen eighty two album of all time. There, if you say nineteen eighty two, there is nothing more eighty two in the world than this album cover. And you know you are. <laughs> A hundred percent correct. One hundred percent correct. It, it is so of its time. It is so emblematic of 1982. And you've got to remember, Fenton has said that he doesn't really get Duran Duran. But when Duran Duran came right. out, is this is before Boy George, before Cindy Lauper, before Madonna, right. before Kaja Gugu, before any of them, and they were these five hot as fuck guys who wore these bright red Versace suits or bright turquoise Versace suits or bright yellow Versace suits with the uh, you know, with the sleeves rolled up and ripped t-shirts underneath, which I had never seen. And they all had these great hair and the men wore makeup and they were just beautiful and they were heterosexual and they were romping through the jungles of Sri Lanka and they were on yachts with models in the Caribbean. And these videos were just colorful and beautiful and they were straight coded. They were heterosexual coded, but gays could love them too i mean there was no you could you could say you were a duran duran fan at school and not be clocked for being gay although all the girls knew exactly that i was you were either (laughs) lusting over john simon roger or or nick and they each had it was like you know boy bands before boy bands because you had your favorite and the, you could argue for hours over each one and the songs on the album Rio Hungry Like the Wolf Save a Prayer for the Morning After Happy Birthday oh. to You that is not one of them uh the chauffeur girls on film two minutes <laughs> later because also the, the videos were all done right, Russell Mulcahy, right? And yes, they were always in yes. exotic locations and beautiful yes, yes, women. They're in these right. out, fabulous outfits in exotic locations with beautiful models. And the songs are so ingrained in our DNA, in our pop culture DNA, that everything about this album, and especially the album cover, just sang to me. Just really, I just it, it was just 
for a little 16 year old boy gay boy it was just everything that i'm not even a huge duran duran fan but that was an iconic album cover i think you may have picked the best album cover i'm, I'm holding my judgment until here at the end but I, I think you beat me this week james i just want you to know i'm getting a little anxious as we do this countdown that there's one album cover i was sure was going to be in this list that and james was like yeah 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 i've got that one and i don't think he's gonna do it i, I i'm just like well, I'm, we have we have runner ups coming up. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay, so um, <laughs> number five. Moving on to number five. Number five. Ian Jury's "Do It Yourself." Now, Ian Jury. Do you remember <coughs> Ian Jury? He was a British kind of Cockney singer. Um, one of my favorite songs of all time. Hit me with your rhythm stick. Hit me with your right, rhythm yeah, stick. Yeah, yeah. Or um, reasons to be cheerful. Um, and he was signed to a label called Stiff Records. Stiff Ooh. Records came at the peak of punk. Stiff Records had Devo. Um, who else did they have? They had uh, Rachel Sweet, Le Lena Lovitch, Reckless Eric, Elvis Costello, Nick Lowe, uh, The Damned. So they were sort of punk and post-punk. And Stiff Records got this guy called Barney Bubbles to do all their design work and design all their covers. I have to say, I think Barney Bubbles is the greatest graphic artist of all time. And the Do It Yourself album, the, the Ian Jury's Do It Yourself, came out in 1979. And the theme, the theme was Do It Yourself, DIY, wallpaper, you know, tools. So... He actually went to Crown Wallpaper, which was the leading wallpaper manufacturer of the time. And this was when wallpaper was not cool. It was naff. It was like something that belonged to the 50s and Victorian era. The colors were all sort of pale and the designs were just sort of grotesque. I, I think all we have to do is look at the image <laughs> of Fenton Bailey right now to see what you're talking about. Because Fenton <laughs> has decorated his home in these naff horrible images <laughs> well moving <laughs> that aside Once um, again nature versus nurture if just you have a love, that way if you have a lot of wallpaper like i do there is no greater excitement than to go to home depot and get one of those thick volumes of just swatches of wallpaper <laughs> and that was barney bubble's idea for do it yourself he said print the album cover on different kind of wallpapers and they did something like 30 variations of the same cover. It's That's absolutely crazy. it's absolutely incredible. Not only that, but um the lettering was like all like with like screws in the letters. And then he created this character, Tommy the Talking Toolbox. I tell you, it's the best piece of graphic design I've ever seen in my life. It's like a toolbox opened up, but it's like a character. And he was just always so endlessly inventive with his graphics. Now, he, but hold on. Can you imagine hmm. having 30 album covers to do? Uh, you, you would add, tell that to the record company that you want 30 album covers and you would be laughed. Uh, you, would, you would lose your, your contract. Imagine the expense. It. Right? And they, Crown Wallpaper even came on board and they would go and wheat paste huge amounts of wallpaper. They would even go to the press offices of magazines and wallpaper their conference rooms overnight so that they went in the next day and their whole conference room had been redone. That's um, fantastic. Yeah, he was amazing. He also did the cover of Elvis Costello's Armed Forces, which is another fabulous, fabulous album. And, and what he did there is he got, so you, know, you remember that, that era of black light paintings and, and the very famous painting of the woman with the green skin. The These Frank, sort of, Frank, was it? Was it yes. Frank, something like that, and, yeah. And so he got an artist to paint a picture of a herd of elephants storming at the camera. And, he really was, like, James, you talk about class Nomi. I think for me, it was like a, oh, my God, naff stuff, kitsch stuff can be really cool. And that taste whole, is cool, in, yes. At that whole inverting it. And it was also post-punk in the sense that it wasn't, like, smash it up and in your face. And it, No, it was incredibly clever and thought out and sort of had this ability to take very – kitschy things or nap things and, and make them cool, but also, and make them menacing. 
Just well, this is, this, that right there, kitschy, cool, classic, menacing, sums up Fenton Bailey to me right now. <laughs> this is one of those things where all of a sudden I'm getting a window into your mind, yes. into your formative. But you have to spell all those words with a K, I think, to make it. <laughs> but it's well, funny because when you showed me, when we were sending back and forth the um the images we were going to use, the mm -hmm. album covers, I saw that one and I was like, what is, what is, I don't even get it. What is that? Because it was just one of the images and now you've explained it to me and I completely understand why this album cover is everything, everything, everything. And in fact, there's even a book, Reasons to be Cheerful, about the work of Barney Bubbles. Barney oh. Bubbles sadly took his own life um, when he was just 41, but this is the cover, I'm just holding it up and we'll post it on our, for um, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick. I have no idea what's going on, but I am viscerally moved by it. There's, it's some sort of dog toy with a bit of string pulling all the bits together so that when you, when you um on the first side of the of the of the single, the whole thing makes sense. But then on the back side, it's like, what is going on? It's all sort of deconstructed and a little bit of Russian graphics and just mm -hmm. very postmodern, uh, just amazing work. I wish well, it he was sounds still like he needs a documentary too. I think you're getting all sorts of ideas here. Right. A documentary no one will watch. What a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I just sent you you guys a text of someone has a, a collection of like all of these album covers on their wall. Oh and, wow. Uh, the well, right. That's the, the get one of the Galahads from Oasis said that you know, in the day, album covers were yeah. poor people's students. It's, you know, that was our his album covers would make great wallpaper yeah. today. What? <laughs> let's go all right we'll take one quick break and when we come back uh continue our countdown any more uh honorary mentions i'll jump in i i, I have to again you guys are so classy and hip and i'm just the squarest guy but i loved olivia Newton john and i i oh. bought the albums i bought the greatest hits because when i was poor in new hampshire I get, but when i went to college there were second hand record stores i'm now in cambridge massachusetts and you can go and buy for a, you know this is before cds this is right before cds and i would buy every living john thing and she's just she's sitting in water and her hair is up and she looks beautiful she's wearing denim and she has her arms crossed and she's just beautiful beautiful and the one that i love the most which is her greatest hits volume two She's wearing a white cashmere set. Her arms, her arm, one arms over her head. It's shot from. She's lying down on her back. She looks, she looks down, and then you see she's wearing kind of like white yoga pants. And when you open the album, it's the same image, but her eyes are closed. So you get to go like this, and she wins. <laughs> okay, that's that. my, that's I, my, I want to just, I want to give an honorable mention to one of the most shocking album covers of all time. That really just it what gives chills down your spine is the Yoko Ono album cover. Uh, shattered glass after John died in his his glasses a, sh a close up of his blood spattered glasses yeah. just mm -hmm. in the, o overlooking Central Park on a on a table or you can make that or you can make a living John blink whichever whatever is your your taste that, 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 that's, the, that's the contrast between us James you uh, deep uh, moving cultural me just at home making living John blink well stick with us and we'll continue the countdown of the greatest album covers that made us go wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. All right, welcome back. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James, Blake. We are counting down the top 10 album covers that made us go wow. And we've reached number four. Number four. Tom has relinquished. Thank you so much, Tom, because I really wanted to talk about my favorite album cover, Holes Live Through This. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. Tell so us about good. it. Describe it. Paint a picture. It is model Leilani Bishop. She's shot by famous German photographer Ellen von Unworth, who has, you know, shot everyone. Yeah. She said, Courtney Love called me and we were on the phone for one hour. I didn't say much, but listened. <laughs> Courtney had the idea. God bless Courtney. Courtney had the idea of reenacting the scene of the 1976 movie Carrie, which I love too. I just met her for the night before for drinks. She was wearing a famous schoolgirl dress. We had some drinks and connected instantly. So the album cover is, you know, a girl who's just won a beauty pageant. It looks like in the late 70s, early 80s, feathered she hair. The fair, yeah, the Farrah Fawcett hairdo. Tiara, um, smeared eye makeup. One of the 
things that made me fall in love with Courtney Love is MTV News used to break in, you know, during MTV. And it, I didn't even really know who Courtney, I knew Kurt Cobain and she was talking about her new album, this album, which tragically came out one week after Kurt's death. Anyway, in this interview from before the album came out, she said, what I want to capture is the look on a woman's face as she's being crowned. A sort of ecstatic um, blue eyeliner kind of running. Um, I am. I am. I won. I have hemorrhoid cream under my eyes and have adhesive tape on my butt. And I had to scratch and claw and fuck. But I won Miss Congeniality. And that's the essence of sickness in this world I'd like to capture. Ooh. And that... Also, the way the, the wallpaper describes Fenton and Klaus Noe describes James, that describes Bla who Blake is today. <laughs> Hemorrhoid right? cream on the face and butt crack. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Fuck now, his way to the like, middle. This is run. Yeah, this is largely considered Hole's like breakout album. They were actually more famous than Nirvana before Ner Nevermind, and then Nevermind came out. And Wait, so, this, this is what was the name of this album cover? This is live through this. This well, is the one. Because to me, I, the thing that I've never understood is the live through this and all the songs on it seem reflective of what she went through after Kurt's death. It's so prescient that she mm -hmm. came, that it came out and it was well, you know, actually what she had to live through. Well, yeah, the, the title of the album was really crazy, but actually these songs are a lot about Lynn Hirschberg who had, written kind of a slam vanity fair piece about oh, her. Oh, right, right. Pregnant. The picture where she's smoking on the cover and pregnant, and they right. said that she was using heroin while she was pregnant. Yes, I remember exactly. that. She was furious yeah, about this, that. This is the album that everyone says Kurt Cobain wrote. He didn't. Um, he sang backup vocals on a couple of songs. That's it. But <laughs> yeah, this is one of my favorite album covers. Oh, one more thing. I love the Barbie... A typeface. Typeface for font. Hole. font. Yes, the Barbie font. The, the, another Stand up, song. show us your t-shirt once again. I know you're going to show the picture. Another dress. song on this album is Doll Part, so it kind of like fits in with the, yeah. but yeah. I want to be the girl with the most cake. Brilliant. Love Brilliant. It. And you're yeah. gorgeous. You're gorgeous, Blake. Mm -hmm. yes, All right, well, let's get on the body. is really working, baby. <laughs> yeah, I know. I want, I want both. I want Blake and the cover. <laughs> 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 All right, moving on, number three. Number three. There are a lot of albums that I was going to choose. I was going to do the Laurie Anderson, Big Science, where she's in the white suit with the white glasses. I was going to do the Velvet Underground and Nico with the Banana album. I mean, I had a whole, I mean, there, there, you could go, we, we could go the, on and on and on and on. We could do this the, all day. The Banana, and like, how could you not? Well, let me tell you why I could not, okay? okay. Because <clears throat> this album that I'm going to talk about right now is one that it, it doesn't really sing to me that the, the songs or anything like that. Right. But it was my brother and sister had this album and they would it was on the record all record player all the time. And I'm talking about um, Rolling Stone Some Girls album. OK, and it's um, there were a number of variations of this album. I think there were 10 or 20 of them, like, you know, you were just talking about with Ian. Um, but it looked like an old 1950s or 60s ad for wigs in the back mm -hmm. of like Na National G National Enquirer or something like that. And they were cheap wigs. And then there were um, peepholes. The faces were cut out. And underneath, you could see the faces of uh, Mick Jagger and Keith, you know, and, and Charlie and, you know, Ron. And as you pulled the album sleeve out, each face got a different wig. So you were looking at Mick Jagger wearing this wig, then me and the Mick wearing another wig, then Mick wearing another wig. And it was one of those things that was so cheeky and so funny and so gay at the time that for me, a little gay boy who wanted to wear wigs, this was as close as I was going to get. And I would sit and play with that because it was just, it, it was so pop and so funny and <clears throat> there were, you know, probably about 50 different images and then you could get different variations of colors and everything like that. Honorable mention to another gay Rolling Stone album <gasps> cover right here. Sticky Finger. Yes! 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 yes, yes, yes. 
which was shot by Andy Warhol. It's Joe D'Alessandro's bulging crotch, a close-up of his jeans with the peen print coming out with the workable zipper that you could zip, da- zip down and you would see the underwear underneath Joe D'Alessandro's underwear. And that, I mean... At the- Johnson's Ben Franklin, I didn't buy that. But the plastic was broken on the album, so people could unzip it. Yeah, you know, so yeah, we, we, sure. we all wanted to look. We all wanted to peep. Sorry. Can yeah, I just no, quickly that, tell a very self-serving story here? I was so inspired by that album that a local band, when I was living in England, came to me. They were called Art Theft. Though so it was Art Theft Records, they came to me and said, "Will you design our logo for Art Theft Records?" So I was like, "Okay." I got Michelangelo's David, the statue, and where the penis is. The hole is where you'd put the record. So when you stuck the record on a record player, up popped the penis. Art theft records. Obviously, my whole career was a waste. (laughs) (laughs) Fabulous, fabulous. So, so those were that was a a very um, uh, inspiring album for me. And I, you know, I'm not a big Rolling Stones fan, but some of their album covers are pretty spectacular. Yeah, I think you're right. It's like often these covers eclipse the music, right? Yeah. The, the, and and the, the sort of images and the, and the signifiers or, or, or what they mean to us is the music's like, oh, okay, it was great. It, the cover. I mean, you know, if you are rolling, so, I mean, there's some girls, I mean, there's a lot of really iconic songs on that album, but it was that, that speaks to me more of my sister's generation and, yeah. and that rather it, than mine. The record is naked and the cover is drag. There you go. Yes. And the cover is very drag. <laughs> All right. Just another um, quick note on um that one. Never mind. I just forgot my train of thought. <laughs> Keep that in the, the Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Number two. Number two. ELO's out of the blue. Oh, I love ELO. And this is we're going back to uh, Kosh again. The amazing designer who did, as Tom was saying, so many of Linda Ronstadt's covers, who also did the Abbey Road, the Beatles Abbey Road yeah. cover, had no idea, who also did the cover for Hotel California. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Just, I get goosebumps just, like, visualizing that hotel in uh, Magic Hour and Twilight. It, it's just, ah, uh, it's just, ah. Uh. And uh, ELO, <laughs> out of the blue, um, the story goes that the designer who worked with Kosh was inspired by the world. It's uh, those fabulous jukeboxes. And for some reason, he decided to put the, the that imagery, those graphics on a Frisbee for his son. And he was like, just playing around in the garden and was like, oh, my God, I'm going to take a Wurlitzer, turn it into a spaceship. And oh, this became. I didn't realize that's what it was. That's what happened. This became the logo. First, it was the logo for yellow, and it was it was round, electric light orchestra, and it was yeah. round, and it was more Wurlitzer. But then, for out of the blue, the double album again, gatefold sleeve, created that logo as a spaceship, and it all came from him helping, you know, dis- uh, tw- tweaking his son's frisbee. And this is one of those things where, like. It wasn't just the cover. It kind of defined the whole band. It defined the whole band because when they went on tour, they built this fucking spaceship and they performed inside it. And it was the peak era of punk rock. And it, I think it also designed the whole, it, it described the whole era in the sense that space was the place. You know, well, I, I was going to say encounters. It, it, it reminds me very much of it, at the same era of the Boston album cover yes. where the band Boston is inside a spaceship and the earth is exploding and you see Chicago and all the other cities yeah. and everybody's leaving the earth and this and it, there was sort of something about the spaceships at the time but also the, this you, you, we talked about how um, the Rolling Stones said like the album cover is better than the than the music inside. But this is one of those ones which I don't know which is better. The, every song on that album is just it's so iconic. Or the album cover, they both work in tandem. Together. Wild West hero, Mr. Blue Sky, ah. Turn to Stone. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the yeah. other thing to underline mm-hmm. that you you've mentioned, but how important logos were. 
mm. sort of three dimensional logos for identifying. <laughs> I didn't know what Boston looked like. I didn't know what ELO looked like. I didn't care. They Van were so Halen. by their logos. The Carpenters had a logo. Captain Neil, they had these things that were identifiable well, and designed. Tom, and one of the reasons for that, though, is like, well, as we learned with Journey and Ario Speedwagon and Foreigner, is that these yeah. bands were so ugly. They were all just so unattractive <laughs> that it was probably best that you didn't know what they Are were. you saying, James, that video killed the radio star? Is that what you're saying? That you're saying? <laughs> That's a whole other um, hour of, of... But typography and logos were such yeah. a study then, yeah. you know? And I'll give you one more kosh thing, because I, I haven't done many honorable mentions, uh, and we'll go to break, but Rod Stewart's Atlantic Crossing. I'll be honest with you. The only Rod Stewart song I ever really liked was Do You Think I'm Sexy? <laughs> I kind of like that one, but I kind of don't care for the rest. The Paris um, Hilton version is. Okay. But Atlantic Crossing, have you seen that? Have I, we'll, we'll I'm post looking at it right book. now. It's He's so like fabulous. In, I've never seen it. In sort of platform boots, bestriding the ocean. And it's one of those airbrush things. And I swear to you, it was it locked in my brain as like, like I've got to go to New York and find James St. James and Klaus Nami. It was just like some sort of. This is my last one up because that picture reminded me. There's hmm. a somewhat obscure album of the Pointer Sisters in the '70s when there was four of them. It's called Stepping Out, and and the big hit of it was uh, "Bet You Got a Chick on the Side." Sure, you got a chick. I know you got a chick on the side. And it's it's an illustration of platform sneaker high heels. It was so urban and so designed. It's it celebrated a time and a place. And you know, the Pointer Sisters came from Oakland originally, and it was fabulous. And it had like a little. The straps were open and cut out. So when you took the album in and out, the straps of the of the back of the straps of the of the platform high heel sneakers. Anyway, you, you got to look it up. It's called Stepping Out the Pointer Sisters. I have an honorable mention. I just okay. sent you guys a text. It's Vampire Weekend's Contra. It looks like a casting photo of a waspy white girl. Wait, and are like you telling me that one of these albums is from the 21st century? <laughs> yes. Well, I'll, I'll, well, I'm going to, you know, it's okay because my second honorable mention is pretty much anything by the cars. No. I, yeah, oh, yes. Yes. Oh, my yes. Oh, my God. All right, we're going to take one more break. Then we reveal the number one album cover of all time that made us go, wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James and Blake. And we've been counting down the top 10 album covers of all time that make us go, wow. Um, we are about to reveal number one. I just have to quickly say, this whole episode was somewhat inspired by Hypnosis, who we haven't mentioned any of their work and who, for me, ultimately will always be the ultimate record cover designers with the Pink Floyd covers, uh, Wish You Were Here, uh, Dark Side of the Moon, and of course, Led Zeppelin's Presence, and many, many, many more. But uh, the other thing is, we know what album covers did. They really pushed the whole art of printing. Because I, as we were talking, I just remembered the very first time I got an album that had a shellac cover. Because album covers used to be flat, and it was that whole printing process of putting a glossy layer on top, that came in the mid seventies. So I, I, I just I, cutouts and foldouts, and they really like a lot of this stuff. Really, I, I, you know, I was going, one of my honorable mentions was going to be the Rolling Stones best of album from the nineteen sixties. That's sort of like the hexagon shape. Remember, it was it wasn't like a regular square album cover. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyway, but th this this number one that, that we've chosen, this yes. is one of the rare times that Tom and I both came up independently with the same album, and we are in complete agreement. Tom, I'm going to let you rip on this, and then I'm going to talk about it afterwards. Okay. Number one is... Number one. From 1965, and it's Herb Alberts and the Tijuana Brasses, Whipped Cream and Other Delights. Now, I've seen this album cover, but I don't think I know any songs from it. Do you guys actually you know? You do it? know all the songs because they were the used on the dating game. This is what this is an album that was in a box of records in our basement that my mother had, and along with like you know Mel Torme and Edie Gorman and Camelot, like a bunch of albums from the fifties and sixties that she didn't listen to anymore. But 
when I discovered it, it's this woman. It's a model named Dolores something. I will have to look it up. Erickson. Dolores Erickson. Dolores Erickson, yes. And she's in, she's nude, completely naked, with 60s bouffant, 60s eye makeup, and she's covered in whipped cream. Her boobs are covered in whipped cream. She's wearing a dress <laughs> made of whipped cream. She's got a dollop of whipped cream on her head. And it was so naughty and perverse. And it titillated me in a way, not because I was turned on by it, but just the idea of being nude on a record cover. cover. <laughs> and I would drag all the neighborhood boys over and we would all gawk at it. And I was the most popular boy in the neighborhood for about an hour every week because I would show them this nude woman. Yes. And you yes. were not alone. It was, I think, the most popular album of the year, outselling the Beatles, outselling everyone at the time. Because Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, which is kind of weird because they weren't, Mexican, but they did this, and and Herb Albert kind of wasn't even really a band. It was the Wrecking Crew, and Herb Albert like d doubling himself. He had bought A and M Records, and they came up with this thing, and it was a huge sensation. And this supposedly she was a friend of Herb Albert and Lanny Hall, his wife. Um, yeah, and uh -huh. it's not whipped cream for the most part. She was in gauze, gauzelin, is that what's called, or and uh -huh. and um and and covered in whipped cream because whipped cream, uh, um, cream regular cream gets sour in the bright lights. It was in the shot in the garage of the A and M uh, gentleman who did all their art and photography, Peter Wharf. And the only part that was real whipped cream was on her head. And then she does this little bit of like a her tongue yeah, out. Yeah, it's her so tongue subtle. Yeah. It's so classy, it's and yet it was the most erotic thing that existed. And every parent had it. They brought it home. I'm sure Dad loved to see it because that. But album it was, was also in every young boy's spank bank as well. Yes. I mean, it was yes. probably Dad's as well. Not <laughs> mine. I think the Rolling Stones one in college well, when not. when Charde came out boys, for straight boys. This was this was the end all and be all. No, but it, it, it affected us all. It made us all no, like like something's it, going on there. It's a but lot of cum. Like, just cum drenched. Also, it's like it, of course you were jacking off to it, Jane St. James. It just looked, <laughs> what was I wanted to hear? Yeah, you're absolutely right. But, but in, uh, in college, in the mid '80s, when Charde came out with smooth operator i felt like that was our herb albert and the tijuana brass it was something that was like cocktail music and you put you know, no need to well, us it was just this like chill songs, music love potion number nine is on it lollipops and lemon treat what is it lollipops yeah. and lemon treat well, lollipops and roses um uh lady fingers you know these songs they're very 60s huh. era songs that you've heard a million times you just didn't know that that's a little you austin know. powers too if you will very you, should listen, powers, you should yeah. listen blake you'd, you'd get a kick out of it listen to it once at least i, I had to confess music you won't be surprised i'd never seen this album cover until just now like i was yeah. like what are they talking about i looked it up so Learn something. Tom, I have to ask you, do you think we've delivered on the premise of, of talking about album covers? I paid attention the entire hour, which is not usually like <laughs> usually I'm taking calls and, and doing emails. So um, while James talks, no, um, I, I loved it. I, I guess we have to leave it to the audience to see if they, yeah. if they could see what we saw, what we, you know, our words. <laughs> I'm maybe we should do a it. sequel. Maybe we should do another album covers that made us well, go Maybe wow. we should just do a podcast where we talk about <laughs> album covers every year. Yes. Week. All right. Well, that's all we got time for. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, James. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Tom. Same time, same place next week. Until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.